Hello everyone and welcome to the Navin Times Talk from the Heart. Our guest today is Dr. Ullas Karan, the director of the Center of Wildlife Studies in Bangalore, which he founded in 1984. And he was the country director of the Wildlife Conservation Society. He has conducted long-term research on the ecology of tigers, other predators and their prey in India and other parts of Asia. In recognition of his contributions, Dr. Karanth has won the World Wildlife Fund's J. Paul Getty Award, elected a Fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences, and was conferred the Padma Shri by the President of India. Hello, Dr. Karanth, and welcome to our show. Thank you for inviting. It's a pleasure. It is a pleasure. Uh, Dr. You grew up in Malinad in Karnataka. What was it like growing up? Because I know you started off as an engineer and then you switched to, to ecology, to tigers, to wildlife conservation. So growing up in Malinad, what was it like? How did this affect you know, and influence this switch later on in your life? I grew up in a small town, not very far from Mangalore. This was in the early 50s. So I was always interested because the culture of Canara uh, district is, uh, um, you know, we have spirit worship, Bhuta worship, then there's the tiger dance. So there was that kind of influence. Plus, my father was very interested in nature in general, being a well-known writer. So we had lots of books on wildlife and an aunt taught me bird watching when by the time I was eight. So I had an interest in nature. Uh, but when I got out of school in 1965, when I got, did my PU, there, were, there was no scope for a career in wildlife. So people uh, either became doctors or engineers, people in my generation. So I opted for engineering because I thought that would give me my bread and butter and then I could use my spare time to pursue conservation as a hobby. But when I was in second year engineering, I read an article by Dr. George Scheller, the first scientist to study tigers. And uh, it was so very different from the hunting books of Jim Corbett and all the lore about tigers that I had read. He was a scientist asking very rigorous questions, collecting data and answering them. And in a year and a half, he learned more about tigers than all these volumes of hunter's tales. So that impressed me and it piqued my engineering mind in some sense i was always approaching things in an engineering way you try to understand and solve problems so i decided at that point in time at some point in the future i'll be a wildlife biologist okay so you have worked so extensively in so many of the forested areas in india but which according to you are the most heavily forested in india like we know in goa we have a lot of greenery and we are very blessed. We, we don't take it for granted, actually. Uh, but besides uh, the Konkan region, which are the other regions that are there? No, India is fairly, ex uh, at one time, was fairly extensively forested. If you look at the natural climate and soil of India, except the Rajasthan desert and the high Himalayas, everywhere else is forest of one kind or the other. But because human occupation of India goes back to modern humans to about 70,000 years, we have deforested a lot, but we still have about 20% of the area legally classified as forest and about 10% of the area is probably in forest in some shape or the other. Uh, and these forest types are different. You can't say one is better than the other. For example, what we have in the Western Ghats, which includes Konkan, uh, Canara and Malabar and further south, we have tropical evergreen forests and then also tropical deciduous forests. Uh, you go to the central Indian plateau uh, and also Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, more, there are more deciduous forests. They don't have large stretches of evergreen forest. And when you go 
back again to the northeastern India, Arunachal Pradesh and all you get these rainforests. All these uh, forest types have unique faunas in the, for example, in the Terai and Kaziranga, you find the flood plains. It's not even a forest. It's just a tall grassland where the grass is so high that you can't see an elephant in it. Even that has incredible assemblage of mammals. You go to the drier areas in Rajasthan and Gujarat, it had its own fauna. So all of it is wonderful nature because India is lucky not because of anything that we Indians did, but be because of uh, our geographic history to be located in a part of the globe where three different faunal realms meet. The Afrotropical, that is species like lion and cheetah and leopard which come from Africa, uh, the regular Asian forests, uh, Asian tropics which is tiger, gaur, all these kind of species. Then we also have the uh, European and North American species like the brown bear and the red deer that come in from the north. So we are very uniquely blessed that way in terms of natural diversity. Now, uh, you spoke that, you know, we have, we are blessed with the different kinds of forests that you mentioned. I can't remember all of them, but you know, uh, what I do understand very well is that we we've, we've had very good forests the forest cover has been great it has uh, diminished of course but uh, from all the all the animals that have that are there right now in 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 our forests which one is the most in danger which is the one we really need to look out for there are you know some species have gone extinct uh, the cheetah is extinct in India, uh, the Javan rhino and possibly the Sumatran rhino which used to occur in the northeast, they are both extinct. So we have lost some species and among the species that survived now, you know, I am basically talking about mammals. I am not a real specialist in every taxonomic group to say what has gone extinct. Mammals and birds. I would say that uh, uh, one of the species that's really one single small population left that is the brow antlered deer in Manipur. It was, it's found in Burma, it's found further uh, in the southeast, uh, it occurred over a large region in northeast India, but there's a single population in Manipur now. Similarly, in among birds for example the great indian bustard which is a beautiful large bird that was very common in the dry plains of india now pretty much it's been losing ground and uh, pretty much restricted to few pockets in rajasthan now so there are there are many species uh, the key to all this is if uh, protected areas were established or somehow the land base was protected from agriculture maybe 200 years ago, 150 years ago. That's where we are finding these animals now. Because the primary reason for the loss of forest in India is expansion of agriculture. As population grew, people converted uh, more forest to uh, fields. And that's the primary driver in the last 200 years. Other pressures like forestry, uh, dams, minings, other things have can, um, come in, but the biggest factor driving deforestation is has a, always been agriculture. So if we didn't protect it from the agriculture frontier, pushing it back, uh, we in those areas we have lost all the forests. But with with increasing population and with you know the economic growth. Economic growth also means we are building more dams, like you rightly said. There are roads being built, and of course, this is taking up the forests, our forests. Now, it's a very, it's a very um, uh, conflicting situation because, on one hand, we have human beings, and on the other, we have the wildlife. So, in a situation like this, how can we have both sides winning, really? Because human beings are definitely the population is growing. But at the same time, we have to look after our, our wildlife. What can we do? How can this be achieved, Doctor? I, I think we have to be very clear about one thing. This argument that you know, we have sacrificed, uh, humans have sacrificed a lot for saving wildlife, 
is simply not true. If you look at the land area of India is 3.2 million square kilometers. If you look at the area set aside for wildlife, which are wildlife sanctuaries, national parks, other kinds of protected areas, it is barely 5% of our land area. Uh, I think it is very unfair for human beings to complain that wildlife is taking, much, uh, taking up too much space and depriving us of our livelihood. It's simply not true. We have basically uh, the remaining 95% of the land we have pretty much used at our will and even this attempt to protect this 5% has been in the last 30-40 years. So I don't think it is a question of choosing wildlife versus humans. It's a false dichotomy. So the question is to me, is 5% enough for a country with such biological wealth or we should try to increase that to say 10% or something more reasonable. I think 5 is abysmally low earmarked for wildlife. Uh, so that's very clear. It's not a question of you know a fair and even treatment and the two are contesting for the land. Wildlife has very little left and we have to actually as human beings increase it. Now is it possible? Is it practical? Is a very complicated question. But I do believe it is possible and it is uh, well within our means uh, because the single as I pointed out what has driven the shrinkage of natural habitats and animal populations two factors expansion of agriculture conversion of wildlife habitats into non wildlife habitats for many species the second one has been hunting traditionally human beings have consumed a variety of species for protein. So if these are the two main drivers, we have to then look at how can we remove these two pressures. So part of it of course is setting up protected areas, uh, patrolling them so people don't come and hunt or have uh, forest management or wildlife management laws say that this fraction of the land there will be no logging or no conversion. So a part of it is preservationist which is in terms of we have the laws like the Wildlife Protection Act, the Indian Forest Act. It is a question of enforcing them. But we are still talking about less than 10% of the area. Uh, but in the longer run if we have to have more area left for nature, we have to make agriculture more efficient, produce uh, whatever we are consuming uh, from the managed lands much more efficient. So even the big dams that you talked about in some sense, although did, they did cause local damage, particularly in the Western Ghats and places by creating a larger irrigated productive region, they increase the production of food for which more and more forests or uh, natural habitat would have been otherwise cleared. So, so it's a question of making agriculture more efficient. The second one is while development does impact uh, particularly if you are putting a highway through a protected area or there are very, very egregious examples of damage uh, to wildlife habitat from de development within courts. But we, the other flip side of development has been that what economists recognize worldwide as the demographic transition. As the economy develops, the number of people depending on the land through farming or animal husbandry or these kind of land based number of people on that declines. The proportion declines. Uh, more and more people move to agriculture, uh, out of agriculture and animal husbandry to service and manufacturing. This, this is a fact of life. This has been a history of the world. We can't True. be an exception to that. Right. Let me just wrap up this argument. So what I'm saying is this demographic transition has both a plus and a minus. Some of the improved livelihood, increased consumption, increased consumption of material goods does lead to impacts 
on nature, pollution in very many forms. On the other hand, it also takes the people off the land. They lose their dependence on wild wildlife or protein and domesticated protein is what they will consume. Uh, the, their impact of livestock, impact of uh, rural transpiration in the, uh, or rural traction in the form of livestock, many, many dependencies go away. So this larger development process has to be wisely managed so that we don't lose what is left of nature. Right. Doctor, you just said about, you know, people big, due to urbanization, there are more people uh, migrating to the urban areas. Now, I don't know how many now uh, of people, who, our viewers will know about this, but there is a government incentive for people to move to the urban areas. Am I right, doctor? I would not say there is a government incentive. It is an economic fact of life. Uh, people are moving because of opportunities are more. In many cases, social discrimination is less. There are a variety of reasons why this uh, urbanization is happening. But the fact is it is happening. When I was born, the proportion of uh, uh, land dependent rural population was 75 to 80 percent of India. Now it is 45, 55 percent. So and this is moving on. This is a process. So what I would argue is that this is what creates more room for wildlife. Because I have in the course of my my own life, I have seen in the higher elevations of Western Ghats, remote areas in Malanad, remote areas in Uttarakhand, People have left some of these areas because agriculture has become <clears throat> uneconomical, unviable, particularly when you have protected areas, animals come back in large numbers, it becomes impossible to raise crops. So people have opted to move out. So this is a trend that as uh, government has a policy, you are right, for these kind of situations, government of India. Uh, the state governments have a policy of encouraging people to move out of wildlife reserves. Uh, but how effectively it has been implemented is a different question. It depends on the context, or the players involved, the officials involved. It's a very mixed, mixed uh, scene there. But would you promote it? Would you promote more people from the rural area moving so that the wildlife get the habitat back? They can reclaim what is was actually theirs? No, I don't think it's a question of me or anybody else lecturing people to move out or move in. Can we create conditions where they feel they are better off by moving than staying where they are? To me, that's the key. And that can be done with dedicated NGOs, dedicated government officials. Uh, over over the period I was, uh, I have been working in the Malnad region. I have worked with governments with other NGOs and we have been able to move nearly 2,000 families out of remote areas. It's not just moving people from uh, one village to the nearby small town. I'm talking about uh, incentivized movement of people from some of the most pristine, precious areas where if they don't go, you will have to give them development there. You have to build roads, you have to build hospitals, you have to build cell phone towers, you have to create employment and that will completely fragment and destroy these remote areas. So, to me it is incentivizing people within areas that are of high value for wildlife to move out. And also, besides, you know, in incentivizing the, the, the move, it's also providing them those things that they want, those needs of theirs being fulfilled. So when they move, they are happier because like you said, some of them move also because of discrimination. So maybe if we give them that, uh, the movement will be much more easier and quicker. You have always been interested with tigers. Uh, the little that I have read up about you, it is about tigers and most of us have heard about the project tiger. Now, why is the tiger being given so much of preference when you have already said that the rhinos, the bustards are some of the other animals and birds that, you know, are, are on the decline. The numbers are on the decline. So why is it the tiger? What is it so important uh, that makes the tiger, you know, actually in everyone's face? To, to actually say it? No, it's basically how you get 
people engaged to protect large pieces of land. So, one of the advantages, one advantage of focusing on large predatory carnivores is that they rest on a pyramid of other prey species which they eat and consume and the prey in turn depends on different varieties of habitats. So when you have a viable population of say 100 tigers conserved, you are actually in effect automatically ensuring literally thousands of square kilometers of forest which uh, that harbor everything from frog to varieties of birds get protected. Whereas if you use the counter argument, say I'll start with the frog, then you get five acres or whatever, the smaller thing. So these species are called conservation umbrella species and we choose them for a specific reason. One of them obviously is their ability to preserve other species in their system. By using this as a yardstick, you get a lot of other conservation done automatically as a part of the same process and investment. The second thing is uh, species that have a strong cultural linkage either through religion or modern um, education, um, they are able to inspire action both in the bureaucracy, in the political sphere and, and common people, stu students, they will get excited about tigers or they will get excited about some other species. I am not saying tiger is the only one. But I am saying tiger is was chosen for that kind of a reason. The elephant is chosen for that kind of a reason. And rhinos in fact uh, would have gone extinct but for the extremely strong conservation efforts that were put in Assam because that was only the last place where they were left in India. Right. Now the problem with the bustard is it lives in these dry forest areas and uh, although among naturalists and ecologists it's a fabulous species, in the mind of the common people it doesn't hold the same sway. So, you know, on the, so the, these are all complex issues, but the idea is to capture and save a lot of biodiversity using these iconic species rather than saving just a tiger. You can have 100 tigers in a zoo which is 500 acres and you feed them meat, you can have 100 tigers there, but that's not conservation. It's it's having the whole prey, predators and habitat all functioning together as a system. Like I said earlier, the, you know, the Project Tiger has been getting a lot of funding, not just from, I suppose, from a government, but also from, you know, international uh, uh, waters. Now, what I would like to ask is, does, according to you, in your opinion, doctor, does this funding go directly for, for conservation of the tigers? And if it is not going directly, what is it that can be done to ensure that this amount which has been given for the tigers to conserve, not just the tigers, and like you said, you know, the entire ecology, there are other animals and birds that are also included in it. So what can we do? To ensure it happens. I, I this ha it has to be looked at the time frame in which we had uh, Project Tiger. In fact, it was a child of the Wildlife Protection Act, which is the major law that came in 1974, uh, which, uh, which is what started off serious conservation in India. So, uh, when all this began, Definitely there was shortage of funds, shortage of resources, uh, some international money came in, but international funding has never been core or substantial part of India's wildlife recovery. It is our taxpayers' money that has gone in, government expenditure over time has far outweighed international funding for conservation different in different countries. I am talking okay. of India. All so, right. I would say from 1970, in the first quarter of this recovery process, the first years of Project Tiger, the money was spent in a focused way on protection. There wasn't too much of it. There was a lot of dedicated forest officers, the first director of Project Tiger, Sankla, the second uh, subsequent directors like H.S. Pawar. There are many people who really 
focused on what needed to be done, spent the money wisely and that's how it all started. But unfortunately what has happened after, particularly after the year 2000 in the last, in the second quarter of this 50, it has all become too much hype and too much glamour around Tiger and the budgets have exceeded the needs far, far beyond what is actually needed to get the job done. So this excessive funding of the same areas rather than spreading the funding to rebuild newer areas as well as funding, uh, ignoring critical funding of incentivizing people to move which would absorb any amount of money or buying pieces of land to connect protected areas. Uh, money is being often wasted on modifying habitats, needless uh, um, you know, infrastructure in the forest, all sorts of things. So I would say the first 25 years uh, tiger recovery projects in India were by and large efficiently done at a reasonable cost. After that the amount of money spent and what we have achieved is definitely not commensurate with what has been spent. Right. It's time for a, a short break. Uh, don't go anywhere. We are in conversation with Dr. Karan. It has been interesting and it's going to get much more interesting. So see you in a bit. Hello everyone and welcome back. We are in conversation with Dr. Ulaskaran, wildlife conservationist. He's been telling us really interesting facts and uh, doctor, let's uh, continue and resume uh, what we were saying. Um, you have said that the money that we have given, uh, you know, we get for conservation of tigers sometimes is a bit too much. In fact, it can be used for other purposes as well. Now, like I've said earlier, and I'm uh, saying it again, Doctor is very fond of tigers. I think one of your favorite um, animals is tigers, Doctor. Yeah, I have studied tigers because I'm, I find them In depth. fascinating. Yes, yeah. you have been fascinated by tigers. Can you, uh, since you've got so much of experience, I'm sure you can recount an encounter with a tiger or maybe something that will make us understand better why tigers are so important in the ecology. Uh, I think uh, the two are slightly different issues about having an interesting encounter with the tiger uh, versus the role of the tiger in ecology. So let me come to the second one first. As I pointed out, large predatory carnivores uh, required a large prey bait. For example, to support a single living tiger, at least 500 prey animals have to be there in its habitat. So when you are talking about a population of 100 tigers, we are talking about 50,000 prey animals of different kinds. So its importance as a uh, umbrella species comes from this energy equation between predator and prey. The second importance comes from the fact that uh, tigers can adapt to a wide range of habitats. For example, in the Russian Far East, they live it temp in winter, the temperatures go below minus 50 degrees centigrade and the tiger makes it there. And you go to Rajasthan desert uh, at the other extreme of their range, uh, it almost gets to be first plus 50 degrees centigrade. And they live in dry forests, they live in tropical evergreen forests, they live in uh, other kinds of reed beds in the Caspian, they used to live in the reed beds in the Caspian coniferous forests in Russia, um, flooded grasslands in Assam and Terai. So it's an adaptable species and so when you protect it over this wide range of habitats, an incredible amount of biodiversity can be saved. So clearly this is the value. As far as own, my own experiment, uh, experience, you have to remember, tigers were extremely scarce 
tigers have come back and you can see them in protected areas now in the last uh, 50 years after the effort began and particularly last 15 20 years you go to good parks like Bandipur or Nagarhole, you can actually see wild tigers. But this was not true. Uh, tigers were extremely, very few tigers were there. If I can make an estimate, in the Malanad landscape where I grew up, when I was growing up in the 1950s as a schoolboy, tigers were on their last legs. Probably there were less than uh, uh, 70 or 80 tigers in that landscape. But today there are 350 or more. So you know, there has been an improvement and that's one reason why you see them. So, encounters with them in initially were very hard. When I got on a motorcycle or hiked up the Western Ghats, Kudremukh, Nagarhole, Bandipur, for the first, uh, I started around uh, 1967 and till 1981, I did not see a wild tiger. It, I had seen tracks but they were so hard to see. There were so few and also because of the intense hunting pressure and human disturbance, they were not habituated to standing and watching people. They would take off and they would hear you coming, you wouldn't see a tiger. Mm. So, so most of the encounters in that sense have been in more recent times. But to me, the most exciting thing was that in the 1990s, late 80s and 90s, when tigers were still hard to see, I was able to do the first study of catching wild tigers and putting radio collars on them and tracking. So I had four tigers and three leopards that I had put collars on in Nagarhole in 1990. And within a few months, I used to track them from a vehicle. It had to be a vehicle because if I followed them or walked, they would run away but they got used to my vehicle because I would position my car, they, then they would accept the vehicle. So these four or five uh, tigers and leopards, not all the others in Nagarhole, got habituated to being watched. It was a transition that took a few months and that was quite thrilling because then tourists started seeing tigers also, this, these tigers. But the moment I stepped out of the car, it will go away. So that whole study gave me some really thrilling moments because I had to dart them by standing on a tree and uh, you know a tiger would come just two or three meters below you and your heart is beating very hard and all you have is a flimsy I can only imagine. Uh, aluminum pneumatic gun. So those gave me some thrilling moments. Doctor, approximately, approximately what is the weight of a tiger? It depends on the age and sex. A very yeah. large male tiger uh, would go up to about 240-250 kilos. Uh, authentically, properly measured ones. There are claims of 300 kilo tigers in the hunting literature and all that, but uh, the records that I have seen from Russia and India, kind of 240-250 seems to be the upper bound. Females are typically at least 100 or 120 kilos lighter this is these are adult animals okay and you said that there were from about 70 tigers in uh, in malinad where you were growing up you saw that gradual increase to about 300 across, 300 plus 300, yeah, 350 across like across india how many approximately no, i am asking you across india approximately how many tigers do you think are there in the wild Anyway, I, I think uh, my guess would be around three to three and a half thousand, possibly closer to three thousand would be the number. But this is, uh, you know, it's very difficult to make measurements at the countrywide scale. I don't believe the government's measurements are accurate because they are based on very deeply flawed methods. But I would say as a rough guess around three thousand to three thousand two hundred, something like that might be a good guess. Uh, but the point is, there is a tremendous scope for having more tigers. For example, Malanad is where I am very familiar, I have made the measurements myself, I don't have to depend on other people's numbers. There may be 350 or so tigers now, but given the forest cover, if the same investment and effort were uh, that's going in now, 
were augmented with more relocation, redirection of funds, spreading of the funds to different areas. Uh, we could have 1300 tigers in Malanad alone. So you wow. scale that up to India. So instead of having 3000 tigers, we could easily have 12,000 tigers in India. Right. If, if so, we do the right things. Talking about funds, can you can you throw light about Kampa? What is what is this fund for? How is it being utilized? And what is the most optimum way of utilizing Kampa? That's a very good. Uh, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, compensatory afforestation was the name of the scheme. The idea behind it was that if you deforest an area for a mine or a dam or some non-conservation purpose, uh, you compensated it by growing that forest elsewhere or an equivalent amount okay. of forest elsewhere. Now, oftentimes it was found that there was no place or uh, uh, no opportunity to necessarily grow somewhere else or even if you grew it would never match what has been lost. Right. So the idea then morphed into saying let, let us put a monetary value and that monetary value should go into a pool uh, of funds meant for conservation and it should be used for bringing back uh, forests and wildlife. Uh, usually within a state. The state, I mean, if something has accrued in a state, it is spent within the state, which was very good. I think it's a very, uh, Brazil and other countries have offsets. They're, they're called by different names, but right. uh, it's a good idea. Uh, but the problem is, uh, if I were asked, what would be the single biggest priority today with these CAMPA funds? Because the funds run into thousands of crores, like 60, 70,000 crores. Wow. It should be to incentivize people to move. It should be to buy parcels of land that would bridge the park or fill holes in the parks because that's something expensive to do, uh, rehabilitating people and buying land. In my opinion, 90% of camp CAMPA funds should be earmarked for that. But unfortunately, once you give a lot of money to people in our system, it is not spent in the most wise way. It is spent for buying vehicles, buying computers, buying tablets, hundreds of things which are not priority. The priority should be consolidating land, protecting habitats, using this vast amount of money that is there in camp. Uh, so it's a good idea, but it's not been managed well. So what do you think we can do uh, to manage this money well uh, and like like you said it is it should be used for you know uh, as an incentive to uh, help people to move out who are the people who take these you know decisions and how can it be streamlined and said this is all it is that is required to be done and we should not um, you know move away from that path See, it's a very hard thing to do when you put money into the Indian government system to regulate and make sure it goes. takes enormous political will, enormous understanding on the political, political leaders among the bureaucrats, the IAS, as well as the Forest Service people who end up spending this money. Uh, often, many of them uh, really don't see the value a lot of them see the value but do not want the money diverted to other things. So there are all these things. When uh, uh, I was on some of these advisory committees, uh, we argued very hard to get this included as one of the items on which they can spend. At the, until that point of time, relocation and consolidation of habitat was not even on the list of eligible items. But it's kind of sat there. Uh, not really being spent well. Uh, I, but also it is doable. I'll give examples in uh, Madhya Pradesh in particular and to a lesser extent in Maharashtra. There were enlightened officers, there were enlightened politicians and there were enlightened uh, uh, bureaucrats who, not all the time over large stretches of time who really focused not just Kampa funds, other funds on this task and accomplished major uh, 
major expansion, major relocations, etc. So it's not that it's rocket science. You, we, I have seen examples. Even in Karnataka, when we got involved heavily in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, we had remarkable success of virtually vacating the Badra wildlife sanctuary. But it took an uh, enlightened minister, enlightened uh, district collector, enlightened chief wildlife warden, enlightened park managers and enlightened NGOs. It was not easy, but it is doable. So basically what you're saying is we need enlightenment. Yeah, we need understanding <laughs> of what is important and not. Yes, if of you course. look at uh, management of telecom sector or uh, some other economic sector, you see that the technocrats, the politicians, whoever take it seriously. The problem is conservation has been trivialized. It is about building a temple for a tiger, calling some tiger collar wali, all this hype and uh, nonsense is thought to be conservation. Or, you know, you go s stories about tigers that tourists see. This is not it. Or a black leopard that's called blackie. Uh, we are losing vision of what needs to be done and getting lost in trivia, whether you are official you are a minister or an NGO. This is the problem. People don't understand what is important and fight for it. Right. You have spoken about, you know, that there have there are many funds that uh, contribute in hopefully getting our forests back and helping conservation of wildlife. Now, we have many of us have heard about the Green India Mission. Has that, in your opinion, helped India to regain some of its forests to put in more life into our forests, into our flora and fauna? I am skeptical because see, in the, uh, the forest department got into this business of growing trees in the 80s, earlier with funding from the British DFID mm -hmm. or the Japanese JICA, there were these donors and I have seen these schemes and the failure rates are so high and the work done is so shoddy, uh, you know, the same area is afforested again and again. Now, point is, if you, you create proper financial incentives, uh, make it profitable for people to farm and grow trees, uh, I think driven by private incentives, that is a better approach. So, Green India Prima Facie looks to me like a replication of all those thousands of crores that were spent in various afforestation schemes, uh, whereas if you use private incentives as well as the fact that uh, grazing pressure is down in many places, natural regeneration is taking place fairly substantially. If you just encourage that through protection uh, and in fact removing settlements and livestock is one of the best ways to afforest a piece of land. So I am not a great fan of Green India mission and such schemes. Which which mission, which fund, which um, attempt, you know, has so far in your opinion helped? It's the one that has been doing the most amount of work. It is advantageous to conserving our forests. Which is that one fund or scheme that you think has been working so far? I would not divide it by schemes, but today every there are so many government schemes, a single True. park yes. uh, which had a 4 crore budget or a 3 crore budget per year now gets 45 crores, way, way too much. So it's not a question of having fancy schemes, it's a question of identifying the needs and filling that. And the major issue which was that there was no money for these things is gone now. There is enough money in the government to do effective conservation question is thinking intelligently and applying it intelligently. Right. Like you said, enlightenment. We all need that enlightenment and then I think we can all see clearly and m f much further. How, Doctor, uh, has the government aided in bringing up the numbers of wildlife besides, uh, besides the funds that they have come up with? Have they put any other new rules? into place that prevents people from hunting and encroaching on forest um, areas? Yeah, absolutely. See, 
uh, one thing is unlike in Africa and Latin America, virtually most of the uh, endangered wildlife species, they're all on government owned land. So the recovery that took place after 1974 was mainly a government effort. It was not the effort of other people. Other people created awareness, but it was the political leadership and the officials on ground, uh, the staff on ground who sp fought and recovered wildlife. The laws were critical to the process, particularly the Wildlife Protection Act of 1974 that uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi enacted, and again in 1990, the, 1980, the Forest Conservation Act. These two were really critical. They gave the legal framework. The conservationists outside the system lent support to these kind of moves and the officials in charge, wherever they were efficient and committed, uh, were remarkably recovered wildlife. If you compare to any other Asian country, the efforts to bring back wildlife have been far more successful than in any other Asian country. We have spoken about the government, we have spoken about people. According to you, you work with so many groups of people. Have you seen a resurgence of interest in wildlife and forests in, uh, amongst the youth? Has there been any at all? Yeah, of course. Of course. See, in, in my generation, when I was going to high school or even college, None of my peer group were interested in wildlife. If they were interested, it was to go and shoot and kill and eat. There was no interest in conservation. My previous generation was even worse. So over time that has changed. Certainly uh, every 10 years, I would say, if you consider a conservation generation, that level of interest has gone up. Uh, so there is no doubt today that there is far more awareness. But there is a the downside in the sense that although awareness and passion for wildlife is there, people are not making the attempt to go a bit deeper to understand problems. They sort of think, uh, uh, you know, wild animals have to be fed like domestic animals, that they have to be wa given water, all these kind of uh, naive ideas are there. But at the level of um, saying we need to have wildlife, we can't let it go, there has been a tremendous, tremendous surge in opinion, uh, public opinion, and that's basically because the youth and the younger generation are driving this change. And if you look at the viewership of uh, wildlife videos, movies, the number of people crowding to national parks to see, these are middle class people. So I have, you know, that's something that's really vital, and we should use that energy to bring back animals on a bigger scale. For sure, for sure, Doctor. If if you could recommend some ways to us where we can get our you more of our youth interested, not just youth, even other people, how what would how would you implement this? What would you do uh, to get people interested? More people, more youth, get them interested yeah, I, in. I um, a lot of people are interested, and I think with the even of TV channels like yours or the media, there is a tremendous opportunity. Uh, but are we talk, using it effectively? Are we using the wide outreach of uh, TV now through all sorts of uh, via the internet, via the mainstream TV? Are we putting good programs out? Uh, I'm not sure. I think that's where they are needed. Uh, uh, for example, Netflix shows a uh, film called uh, Animal Planet. Tiger King. Tiger, no, Animal Planet is kind of okay. Tiger King is rubbish. But people are watching it more and spending more money watching it than watching something sensible. So I, I think uh, the material is not there to educate people mm, in an interesting way. Uh, the absorption capacity is there, people are interested. So I think the responsibility is in some sense on you, Maria, to produce stuff that's interesting and useful for wildlife. We have taken the first step by interviewing you. Um, this is just no, the first I, step. No, not interviewing <laughs> you, but I think the media as a whole. The second of course. point to re is I think we are focusing a lot on English media where reasonably good stuff is there. 
ఐ థింక్ ఇన్ రీజనల్ లాంగ్వేజెస్ కన్నడ తమిళ్ తెలుగు ఎనీ ఎనీ లాంగ్వేజ్ ది కవరేజ్ అండ్ నాలెడ్జ్ అబౌట్ వైల్డ్ లైఫ్ ఇష్యూస్ ఇస్ ఫార్ ఇన్ఫీరియర్ అండ్ అ లాట్ ఆఫ్ పీపుల్ ఆర్ దేర్ ఐబాల్స్ ఆర్ దేర్ వీ నీడ్ టు గో దేర్ టు రైట్ రైట్ ఇస్ దే ఎనీథింగ్ యూ వుడ్ లైక్ టు టెల్ ఆ గోన్ audience it's not just go- the goan audience there will be a much bigger audience who will be watching it but our focus has been goa of course so is there anything you would like to tell our goan audience doctor uh, i i want to say that uh, you know one of the species that i surveyed when i got interested in wildlife was the lion tailed monkey it is a unique species found nowhere in the world but western ghats and that too in the not in the northern part of western ghats and i found a large population in karnataka it's a spectacular species but when i go back and look at the historical records it was also found in goa uh, so goa hasn't had a very effective history of conservation that's partly because uh, uh, whatever under the colonial rule Uh, the british colonial system had a much more uh, tighter control on forest management compared to the one that was prevalent in goa the so portuguese. a lot of indiscriminate hunting mm. went on uh, uh, and even deforestation mining all those were much worse in goa compared to further south in karnataka so i think the time has come for goa to kind of restore its own pristine glory there are uh, good forests in goa they are almost as good as the ones in uttar kannada uh, there's still sufficient area and there are fiery conservationists in goa now who are interested and i hope uh, goa will regain its glory we intend to and as i said the first step was you know getting the people to know more about conservation why is it important so I would like to say thank you to you doctor you've taken so much of your time out for you know answering our questions it has been enlightening for us and like you said we need more enlightened people so thank you for enlightening us thank you for joining us and to all our audience i hope you are as enlightened as i am and like doctor said it is everyone's responsibility it can't just be a few people the forest belong to us the funds belong to us it is not just anybody's funds so let's work together and make not just goa but the whole country a greener and a better place not just for ourselves but even for the flora and the fauna so doctor thank you again and to all thank of you all my pleasure happy to be with you thanks so much and to all of you all thank you for watching for your time and for your patience and until next time take care of yourself thank you and bye bye Thank you.